Well, good morning. I'm, I'm Sylvia Weisberg, uh, one of the co-editors of this uh, book. I'm a professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs here at George Washington University. Thank you for coming this morning, although everybody's sitting in the back like my students. So but it should be OK. Uh, and thank you for the authors for coming here. Um, this is the book that uh, we are presenting today. Uh, Rafael uh, Obregón uh, and I, uh, what we try to do with, the, with this book is to provide an overview uh, of where the field of global health communication is right now and try to identify interesting theoretical debates and lines of practice and lines of uh, research. Uh, and I think that's what the book does. The book has over 30 chapters, more than 40 authors uh, from around the world, uh, and it's packed with, I would say, very interesting insights into how we can use theory to inform practice and, and research. Um, what are some of the most interesting and innovative ways of, of thinking about health communication? Um, we try to do justice to, to, to the tremendous richness of the field even though this is a very thick book, as you can see, uh, still, they are f it's very difficult to capture all, all that in one book. But I think that what we, what we tried to do and we succeeded is saying this sort of a state of the art about the kind of data uh, that, that we have about where, where the field is. Uh, and what we tried to do this morning is to have a conversation uh, about what's happening in the field right now. Um, one of the questions that I, that actually Rafael and I have while doing this book is to what extent what we know about where the field is, is widely known in global health programs. Or if what we know about health communication is sort of a well-kept secret that not necessarily uh, people in policy circles, donors, um, NGOs actually know about the kind of work that, that we do that our colleagues have done for decades um, around the world. Uh, so I would like to engage the, the authors in a conversation about um, some of these issues. So let me introduce the authors here. Um, let's, say to, let's say to my immediate left, Doug Story, uh, Director for Communication Science at the John Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Next to him is Doug Evans, who is Professor of Prevention and Community Health in the School of Public Health and Health Services here at GW. Uh, next is uh, Kerry Scott, who is a PhD student at John Hopkins University. Uh, next to her is Julie Pullerwitz, who is Director of HIV AIDS programs and TV Global Program at PATH. Next to Julie is Greg Pirio, who is President of Empowering Communications. And next to Greg is um, Elizabeth Fox, who is the director of the Office of Health, Infectious Disease, and Nutrition at USAID. Okay? So let's get started. Uh, what I um, envision that we're going to do is to have a conversation for uh, 20, 30 minutes here, and then we're going to uh, open the floor for your comments. Um, so the first question that I had for all of you is, um, I think that what, what the book uh, does is sort of offer an, a survey of where the field has been and where it is right now. What are, in your thoughts, some of the most interesting lines of uh, inquiry and research uh, in the field right now? What are some of the most promising ideas that we're working right now that sort of need to be further developed, further discussed? I don't know if anybody wants to start. Doug? Sure. Make sure it's on. So, hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. I mean, I think one obvious candidate would be uh, <clears throat> new technologies, uh, in particular mobile technologies. Uh, I uh, would um, bet that every single one of you is carrying a cell phone. Uh, and as we know, in uh, many countries in the developing world, there are far more cell phones than there are all other forms of technology uh, combined in the population. Uh, TVs and uh, home computers and so forth put together, there are more cell phones in many countries than there are all of those things. Those are tremendous tools, uh, new channels through which to deliver uh, health communication. Uh, we've been doing that for a while. Uh, I don't think we know very much yet about how to do that well. Um, there's starting to be some evidence, uh, but it's pretty thin. 
And uh, I think that's an area, a very promising area that we need to explore further. Thank you. Julie? Hi. Um, well, some, an area that I'm really excited about is the, the growing opportunities to address gender dynamics um, in health communications and understand more about how gender affect, affects health outcomes and what we can do to integrate gender-focused programming to influence these health outcomes. So, for example, we know a lot now about how inequitable gender dynamics, whether they be related to um, men being encouraged to have multiple sexual partners or women not being supported to get education, leads to negative health outcomes. And over the last five or 10 years, I and my colleagues at PATH and various partners have been engaged in a portfolio to try to use innovative communication strategies where it be related to interpersonal communication, group participatory education, or community mobilization, or small media, or, or mass media, to try to um, see the effects of programs in different countries. And the chapter, for example, that I was involved with uh, writing compares some of our lessons from Brazil and India to very different cultural contexts, where we saw that when you use these communication activities, it led to, one, more equitable gender norms. We do a lot around measurement, the gender equitable men's scale, and it also led to better health outcomes, so, or better, uh, more um, preventative behaviors, like more condom use, reduced gender-based violence, um, increased contraceptive use. And so this, this is an area that I think there's been increasing interest and opportunities for funding, and I'm seeing lots of excitement around the work. So we're excited now to do, and what I think is missing is that while we know how to do work on an individual level or in a small group setting, we don't yet really know how to work on the community or how to institutionalize these exciting projects so that you can see impact when you try to scale something up. And so that's what we're trying to work on now with funding from anonymous donors and the Nike Foundation and others. So that would be my contribution. Yeah. Follow on that. Got it. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to follow on uh, some of what Julie said. I agree with uh, virtually everything. But I think um, in our field, we've, in a way, we've been trapped too long in, in a sort of a dilemma of our own making, uh, where we, um, we talk from different theoretical perspectives. We all believe very strongly in the power of communication to change people and to change society. But we come at those questions from different theoretical perspectives. And I think we're, at a, we're beginning to, to reach a point where some of our, our methods for documenting the effectiveness of communication at different levels, at the individual as well as the community, and even at the, the societal level, are catching up with our theories. Um, so we're in a, in a position now where we have multi-level analytic approaches. We have um, the ability to measure change over time, sort of sequential change, how one, how one input has a catalytic effect over time. Um, and so this really gives us some of the tools that we need to look at phenomena, communication phenomena, at the different levels and over time. And I want to just sort of do a shout out to USAID because I think their support for health communication over the past 30 plus years, 40 years perhaps, um, uh, their investment in long-term programs, uh, multi-year programs, has really helped to push this field forward and uh, the, the opportunity to to look at cumulative change um, and even to do some comparative work, national, cross-national comparative work, um, is largely due to their investments, I think, in health communication. So thanks to USAID. Anybody else wants to follow up on, on Doc's comments? Alice? I can't take credit for 40 years, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> But we are, we are at, at USAID obviously looking at a lot of these new challenges. And I think Julie's put her finger on one of them, which is the whole issue of gender um, and also the issue of measurement. So um, I'll come back to this later when I'm looking at sort of how communication and health communication is changing at USAID. But I do want to say that the newer areas that we're looking at, um, 
you know, you hate to lead with technology, but technology is so out there. Um, gender, of course, but gender in a different way, as, as something that just is going to permeate a lot of the processes and um, access to communication throughout societies. And obviously that old word we use all the time, community, but getting your hands around community in terms of measurement has been very important. Let me follow up with that, with um, Elizabeth's comment on one question, which is the question of, uh, of evidence. We have several chapters in the book that actually document uh, impact, uh, not just on communication indicators, but on health outcomes as well, um, both addressing just plain evidence and also cost effectiveness issues. But it seems to me that those questions still, we are still asked as a field to show evidence, show, show impact. And I'm wondering if that is it's a question that we have answered successfully, but we have not communicated successfully, or there are still important gaps in the question that still the field has to address about how we document, how we address questions of impact. Who wants to take that? Oh, go ahead, Julie. Okay, let me try that one. All right, let me, let me start with a, a couple thoughts about, about evidence and if effectiveness. I'd uh, love to hear from my colleagues as well, and then I'll talk about cost effectiveness. In terms of evidence, I think we have a fair amount of evidence now that shows the effect, maybe not necessarily the impact, but the effect and outcomes of communication strategies. So we can see increases in awareness related to campaigns and let's say have TB symptoms. We can see increases in demand for services such as looking at uh, HIV and TB integrated services, the importance of that. PATH is heavily involved with that in Tanzania and some other countries. I think we see evidence of um, increased skill building. So for example, condom use negotiation. You see evidence of you know, advocacy kind of work. So if you look at advocacy, communication, and social mobilization of TB, a um, lot of work with, on the international level, Stop TB Partnership, et cetera, you see evidence around, um, so advocacy, there could be training of health providers. So there's lots of different things that communication strategies do. I think the challenge right now um, in terms of conveying this is, is thinking of it as communication as part of a larger program. So um, uh, it doesn't do everything. I mean, it's part of a larger program, it's part of a larger health system, and we have to manage expectations of what we think communication strategy should and can do. Um, turning to cost effectiveness, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, frankly. That um, I remember that special issue that came out, Journal of Health Communications. I remember it was really difficult, if I remember correctly, the editors telling me, Jane Burchard and others, really hard to find articles that look at cost effectiveness. And I think that programs in general don't have costing as part of their scope. Um, not even doing the cost per output, cost per person reach, never mind a cost effectiveness. So that's a challenge that I think we're all trying to address now. And um, just as an example, so um, PATH has a uh, Canadian CETA fun uh, funded program called Arise, where we're focused on cost effectiveness and trying to reach it's HIV prevention for most at risk populations, uh, such as in Zambia, couples, VCT, et cetera. And, um, and there's a th we're trying to reach a threshold of $500 per infection averted. And we're trying to test to see if these different strategies will reach that threshold. So it's a really high bar. It's tough, but we're going to see how that goes. So that's, that's what I was saying. Talk. The comment about um, uh, communication as part of multi-component programs. I think we have some great examples of, of that in, in, at work. Uh, for example, from the tobacco control field where we have a set of evidence-based recommendations for best practices uh, from tobacco control. The CDC has a, an excellent publication. They updated recently on this, um, both in the U.S. and in um, uh, international contexts. Uh, what we know is that communication programs are part of a much larger solution that includes community-based programs, that includes uh, uh, tax and regulatory uh, policy change, uh, that includes uh, multiple uh, components. And communication programs are part of the solution. They're not. Uh, the only part. So I think we have to keep that in mind. Uh, so there is an existing evidence base that we can draw on from other fields 
uh, in our work in reproductive health uh, and, and other areas that are of interest to international development. I think the other thing is uh, issue around evidence is I've done a fair amount of systematic review work myself is when you go out and look at the literature, what you often find is that there, we, we do a terrible job of reporting, uh, consistently reporting the results of, of our studies. Uh, uh, there's a lot of um, messy reporting that goes on in the literature. Uh, uh, and it's often difficult to uh, compare the effectiveness of different programs. So I think as a field, we need to think about that uh, and do a better job of consistently reporting effect sizes of programs, methodologies, uh, so that frustrated systematic reviewers like me can uh, feel happier. Anybody else? Talking about take or? Okay. Maybe just one more point. I, I, I sort of come back to this idea of longitudinal effects. I, if we continue to think of communication as something that has sort of direct immediate impact on behaviors, on attitudes, and so on, uh, maybe even on, on certain things, actions that are taken at a community level, uh, I think we're going to miss the opportunity to measure the, the, the long-term effects that communication has, um, the sequential effects. So we change sort of at certain attitudes and behaviors that in turn affect the way that communities operate that influence policy, and these things happen in a sequential way, sometimes over a period of years. And so I don't think that we have, to date, done a very good job of documenting that chronological effect of communication um, that operates at multiple levels. So. And is that because of the field? Is that because of where the funding is? I mean, what are the reasons for why we still sort of measure more short-term rather than long-term effects? And I think a lot of it has to do with funding cycles um, and, and sort of pressures to demonstrate uh, effects quickly. Um, but that's not the only thing. I, I think we're also um, somewhat limited by our own perspectives. We tend to, to look for short-term fixes um, and uh, instead of looking at communication as a long-term social process that has long-term consequences. Elizabeth? Also, the framework within which we work, and I want to call your attention to the the, the plug that uh, my boss made for this uh, book, which I think really comes from his broader perspective. Um, and Ariel Pablos Mendes, who's our new assistant administrator for global health at USAID, not a communication person, um, health person, um, is really excited about looking at communication, social, and behavior change within a broader implementation science perspective. And I think that's a framework, I mean, it's, it's easy to say implementation science, what's that mean? But looking at it in terms of how to get things done in the real world and how to look at longer term change, broader change, more sustainable change. And instead of answering that old sort of sawhorse of a question, you know, does communication work? Um, looking at the interaction in the broader uh, combination of things that happen when social change occurs in a society around a health issue. Um, and that's what we're struggling with and, and also moving into um, around a lot of the communication social change programs at USAID. Kerry, I wanted to ask you a question because it's related to what many have mentioned already. You wrote a chapter with Catherine Campbell on community mobilization in India. One of the issues is health insurance, and, and, and my sense is that is powerful evidence in your chapter about how the process works and why it is effective in achieving those, those goals. So what will be sort of the next step forward to basically coming out of that sort of line of research on community mobilization around health policy, health services? What is still that we need to know better in terms of documenting impact? So a lot of what we looked at was um, the idea of transformative communication where you have efforts to build the voice of the people who are supposed to benefit from the changes in health policy, but also not only building their voice to speak up about what they need, but also have a receptive policy environment at the top. And that really looks at issues of power and dialogue, two-way communication. And I think India came up as, well, it's also where I've worked for a couple of years, and it's a really interesting place to look at this issue because for one of the more unique times you actually have a government that is listening to some degree and they're creating some structures primarily in like pilot projects where they're 
setting up systems of public health tribunals where people actually can come and speak about the denial of health care rights. And on the stage with them are you know, ministers of health who are supposed to listen and respond and problem solve together. But what I think um, I'm struggling with as a PhD student looking into this and what I think comes up in our conversation is about measuring impact because this is a very longitudinal process and it is about power change and about policy and there, there's a lot of uh, funding changes at the same time. So I'm really struggling with the question of how do you measure the effect of, of these, these dialogues and this type of two-way communication that they're creating space for in India because it is so embedded in a context. So that's what yeah. I'm looking at. Thank you. Great. How about the work that... Um, I haven't studied across the literature, but I've had the good fortune the last several years to be out in the field a lot. Um, well, different levels. Everything from uh, looking, helping to write WHO guidelines to, to walking from village to village, seeing, talking to people about, you know, different programs and how they're working and uh, what it means for their families and that. Uh, one of the things that strikes me, it, stru it struck me uh, recently, and I think it goes to the issue of the length of programs, is I was recently, uh, last year, at the end of last year, in Mozambique on a project looking, I was looking at best practices in communication in an agriculture, nutrition, sanitation program. What was clear to me was the, the US, this was a USAID funded program, and that Communities that had, were part of successful programs over the years were really ch off the charts in terms of what they've accomplished. And, th and these are societies people had to confront the slave trade and then they had predatory colonialism and then after independence they had 17 years of civil war. And so they're reconstructing you know, their communities in ways they haven't been constructed before. And uh, I just thought, just wonderful results, but it takes time. So, you know, that's, that's one thing to, to point out. The other thing is, and it's a challenge in implementation all the time, is taking these nice concepts that come out of Western research and translate them into communal contexts where uh, notions of individuality uh, are quite different than, right. than what exists. And so that, that's, that seems to be a really, a, a, you know, a persistent challenge. Having said that, I've seen so many success stories out there where there's been persistence, where community has bought into it, where community leaders have been brought into to programs from malaria control to you know, uh, TB, to all, all across the board. And, right. and, but, but the duration of programs is very important in engagement. And one final thing, I think from the programs that I've had to assess, what I think is often missing is involvement in community in planning systematically what they're going to do, dividing the momentous task into small steps and little successes and coming up with a calendar to achieve because otherwise it can be uh, never ending. Right. Uh, and getting that kind of buy-in is important. And in these agricultural communities I visit, these people have these skills. They're needed in agriculture all the time and they're easily to adapt to nutrition and and health and all kinds of uh, health aspects. Let me go back. I mean, in the context, yes, Tony. Oh, I had a follow-up. Okay, sure. Thanks. I just wanted to follow up on that question about the length of the program. Um, I mean, how you can track projects, how you can do the evaluation, how you can do this longitudinally, how you do this multi-level, et cetera. Just a thought, which is what I've ended up doing in my experience with colleagues, is basically cobbling together this res a basket of projects around different research concepts or ideas. So I mentioned the gender one originally, or it could be some of these transformative communications. And different donors in different environments have different, you know, USAID and the, the, the Global Health Initiative in terms of the framing now is really, I think, a great step forward in terms of focus on the evidence, focus on the ME, having the gender included, but also trying to be more multi-year. Uh, multi, multi but it is really challenging. It's hu often huge in scope, the funds, but limited amount of time. And then you have other donors who can really do a long-term, more longitudinal work and sort of bringing this all together to answer the bigger picture questions with different 
you know, different takes on the question with different types of studies and doing mixed methods and just different strategies. And that seems to be the way that we've been able to move the portfolio forward given the, the various constraints we talked about. So given what we know and the challenges that many of you mentioned, and going back to the question of mobile health that Doug and Julie already mentioned, um, what sort of needs to be done? There is a lot of excitement, and by the way, if you are an avid Twitter, you can Twitter, the hashtag is GlobeHealth.com, and if you never tweeted, this is your great opportunity to <laughs> get started. So the question is, there is a lot of excitement, as Doug said, and uh, a lot of funding, a lot of projects, a lot of ideas, in fact, way outside communication. People doing mHealth who never thought about communication, never took a class in communication, never did any communication research. Um, so the question is, what sort of needs to be done? What kinds of questions need to be asked? What kind of research need to be done in order to address some of the challenges that still exist in our field and show that you know, mHealth does contribute to addressing some of the problems that we have in terms of health outcomes, but also some of the questions that we still have in health communication. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I recently completed a literature review for the Gates Foundation looking at social behavior change communication uh, for family health over the past 10 years or so. And most of the examples, and this has been alluded to already, most of the examples of the use of sort of the newer social media, cell phones, mobile technology, um, uh, are still focused on communication as transmission. We're still looking at those as sort of new delivery channels as opposed to looking at how they are part of a, of a communication process. And I, if I had to sort of identify one sort of shift in perspective that's critical for our field, it's uh, thinking beyond communication uh, uh, delivery and, and direct impact and thinking more about communication as a process. So the question is how do, uh, you know, how do smartphones um, change the way that people build relationships? Um, at, uh, at a recent conference in Seattle, um, there was a lot of discussion about the use of mobile technologies for individualized storytelling. Right? I mean, in a sense, you put a, a hand phone in someone—I mean, a smartphone in someone's hand—and they immediately become a film producer. Right? So, thinking about ways that 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 these mobile technologies, these decentralized um, uh, technologies that that cede control over the technology to the end user, um, and the ways that they use those to build social relationships, I think, is a, a really critical issue for us to look at going forward. So, just to build on that a little bit, I think the other thing we need to think about is how <clears throat> the use of mobile technologies transforms how we live and how we manage our own health. I mean, you know, think about the way that you use your smartphone, if you have one, to manage your life in ways that you didn't do 10 years ago, couldn't do 10 years ago. Now think about that applied to health. And for example, I'm working on a project uh, that involves uh, essentially uh, managing, individuals managing their health care, health care around cancer screening in particular, using mobile phones as, uh, as the as the platform, and that's that's about a communicate that's about a dialogue with your doctor, basically, about maintaining a relationship with your doctor to manage your health care. So you know that's a that's a fundamental kind of change in the way an individual might manage their own health care. So we need to think more about how that applies to a whole range of topics that we're interested in, and that that is a communication process, and uh, it's thinking about it as a dynamic process and one that changes norms and expectations and essentially our, our lifestyles, uh, which has already happened. It's just that we haven't really integrated that into the communication research that we do. Yes, sir. What we look at in, in health um, always comes back to health, not the communication side. It comes back to the public health impact. And the two things that sort of jump out, and they're really hard to measure, but they're not, um, is scale and cost. I mean, what mHealth is doing is changing the scale that can happen with a public health intervention in a way that we never thought of before. And it's also drastically changing the equation on what things cost. And uh, when you go into a country, Bangladesh, what, 85% uh, cell phone use, um, 
And we're beginning to see things like um, impact of cell phones on maternal mortality and a village midwife being able to call when there's an obstetric emergency or send a text and, and quickly change how things happen. And those are things, as communication people, we've never measured before. Um, and it's like the questions are evolving much quicker uh, than we are in terms of how do you measure this? Because we're continually being asked, so how do you know this is where you want to put your money? And I think there we've got to reach out to a much broader set of partners who are already working in different fields in M everything and, um, and begin to look at those methodologies. Julie? Building on uh, Elizabeth's point or taking it um, from, from my perspective, I'm also really interested in what's not working because I feel that a lot of folks, there's a lot of innovative, a lot of innovation going on out there, a lot of little attempts to do something, often on a very small scale. We reached 50 people with this, 100 people with that. And, and they're exciting, and folks are excited about it. But it doesn't always work. It often doesn't, for whatever reason. And I have no idea what's not working. And things are really rarely published. And so I'm to hear about that yet. We're still early in that process, I think. So for example, we're, we're doing, we're trying to use text messages to encourage people in Zambia to come back for follow-up visits for couple counseling. And it's not working very well. Um, often the, the lines are down, um, folks aren't getting the messages for whatever reason, so we need to try a new strategy. Another strategy that we've been engaged in in Kenya, where it was essentially a contest, a contest for youth. They get questions and then they send in answers and then it's published the responses in the newspapers and that's been really successful as a way to highlight, you know, youth and their answers and, and give, you know, rewards and such. So that's been really successful and um, I think that we still need to learn a lot from each other about what, what's working in our, with our innovations. Karen? One more thing that comes to mind looking at all the changes with technology is um, back to that idea of transformative communication. Not only is like, how is it changing them out there, the people in the developing countries, and also how is it coming back and changing us and our structures. The fact that we can hear from them so easily and in the government they can hear back. You have the stories of kids who take a picture of their classroom when the teacher's not there and let the government know that no one's come in. So there, there's kind of that, that other direction that the communication can come to, to the government level, but also to the academics, to the rich teenagers here who do the Coney thing, and that's been very controversial. And I think it's really interesting to study how it changes us and our ability to understand what people are going through and what they need, and to really start addressing the power dynamics, because these direct methods of communication can really get us to think as well, and they can reach us, so. Right. Um, yeah, well, let me talk a little bit about e-learning. Um, as for health professionals, because that's a form of communication here. And actually, this is a project that my company um, did with PATH. And we piloted in Kenya, and we're going to scale up now. Um, and that's where we, we got some, uh, it was, TB was the, the topic, and we used uh, satellite internet to go into hospitals, and we had interactive learning with, among five hospitals in western Kenya. And we had the best people in the country. And in, in our research showed that, that the new information, the new uh, approaches uh, were getting right to, to the healthcare provider at the hospital uh, so much quicker under this. But one thing that we learned that we weren't expecting was when we did the Q&As with the people in Nairobi who were the experts, the vertical learning that was going on between the hospitals was astounding. I think people got much more out of what they learned about what people, how were people in this hospital handling the situation. It was horizontal, it was horizontal <laughs> rather than vertical. That's, that's the term we, we use. So, so that technology allows us to, to experiment and play with things that we didn't before. And we, I think we have to be open to, to new paradigms and to, um, and, and if I could make a point here, is the need, in my piece in the book when we're talking about journalism, to need to go from the objectification of the audience, uh, the objectification to the subjectification all the time. It's so important, and, it, and it's very important in e-learning too. And it makes all the difference in the world, I think, in terms of personal and community empowerment. Doug, you want to say? 
you want to add anything? No. Um, my sense is that from, from what you're saying that we seem to have evidence on questions related to health systems and data management and how mHealth can be successfully used for that. And then there are plenty of experience and maybe anecdotal experience about um, empowerment issues and community dialogue, which at least in my read, I haven't seen that sort of capture showing how that actually happens and why that happens in some cases and not in other cases along the lines of what Julie was saying earlier. How about other sort of perennial communication questions related to uh, social norms, for example? Uh, questions related to attitude change. Question to intention to change. Um, do you know of any sort of interesting mHealth applications to address some of those questions? I haven't seen too many of them, so that's why I want to collective sort of brainstorm. Although we know that brainstorm now it doesn't work as well as we used to think, but anyway. Well, I'll just, I'll just tie it back into the topic of the chapter that I wrote, which is basically looking at those who have done what you just talked about the most successfully, and who might that be? Commercial companies. I mean, Coca-Cola was the uh, leading social media brand worldwide in 2011. They didn't even get on board with social media until about three or four years ago. Uh, the reason that they take it so seriously and they're investing so much in it and spending so much time on it is it's an incredible way for them to build their brands, for them to uh, build what I call brand equity, which was the topic of the chapter that I wrote, which I want to give a shout out to my um, colleagues at PSI who worked with me on this project. Uh, but basically, uh, USAID and um, other donors have been funding the development of health brands for a long time, condom brands, uh, bed nets, other health products, which is something that goes on much more in the um, developing world than it does in the US, although there are some examples of it in the US. Um, but we haven't done anything to use mobile health technologies to enhance those brands, very, very little. You see what's going on in the commercial sector, and that's all their, that's you know a very large part of their focus. Uh, Fortune 500 countries uh, companies at this point is using social media, mobile media, in order to enhance the value of their brands. So we need to try to. I mean, we have lots of examples to work from, uh, and we need to um, uh, learn from those examples and try to apply them in in M Health. You know, uh, changing norms, changing health behaviors is very much like creating and marketing a product. It, uh, there are many similarities, and we know that already, but we haven't really been using the new technologies to, uh, to achieve those goals. At this point, I would like to ask you to come up with questions, comments, thoughts on, on what we were discussing. I'm not going to call you as I do in class, so. Yes, if you can identify your, yourself. Entertainment education. Do you want to go with my book? Uh, there, there are a million of examples. There's, uh, uh, there are a lot of very interesting projects coming out of South Africa right now, uh, ones that I'm familiar with um, at, uh, at CCP. Um, the Cha-Cha the television drama, which is a sort of long-running AIDS prevention um, television serial, um, is, uh, has been evaluated extensively, and it's very powerful. There is even some evidence that it's contributing to um, uh, a reduction in HIV uh, infection rates, HIV prevalence, um, certainly having a major impact on condom use, uh, particularly with younger generations. Um, there's another new project called Intersections that focuses on, it's another television serial drama that focuses on uh, sexual networks, and it's a you know it's a uh, a series of characters who don't know each other but are connected by their sexual networks. Um, some very powerful stuff that sort of pushes the envelope in terms of what's uh, you know what's proper to talk about, and and uh, you know opens the door on discussion of very sensitive issues. So I think there are a lot of examples right now of some very powerful entertainment education projects. Um, those are just two that I know from South Africa, and there are many others. There are a few extensively discussed in the, in the book 
the radio programs uh, done by Minga in, in Peru until very recently with a lot of documented impact. Um, that actually there's a chapter that provides a serving overview of what we know about entertainment education and new directions. Anybody else wants to follow up on the entertainment question? Or? Other questions, comments? Frank. In terms of connecting the technologies to behaviors and social interactions and a, a little bit more what you meant by that and some examples that you might cite uh, where we're actually seeing it as more than a communications device but as a sort of behavioral device. Um, well, of course, there are a lot of examples in the popular press about you know the Arab Spring and the role of, of uh, cell phone technologies to link uh, you know, demonstrators and to mobilize and coordinate uh, social action. Um, but I think I would sort of come back to the, one of the, the questions that Silvio asked about um, how communication influences social norms. If you think about where norms come from, they're a product of sort of seeing ideas and behaviors uh, in, your, in your network and in your society, sort of visibly seeing what other people are doing and thinking. And uh, you know, extrapolating from that to um, uh, you know, estimate the prevalence of ideas or behaviors and the, the support that they get. And I think the, some of the mobile technologies, these decentralized technologies that we have now, um, allow people to share those ideas and make them more public um, and create a, 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 a much stronger, well, create the opportunity to see what other people are thinking, to hear what, uh, about what people are doing um, you know, out of your, si out of your, your, your immediate uh, environment. And so that encourages this notion that what people are doing may have uh, you know, a bigger uh, presence in society. And it does shift the, the perception of norms, what's acceptable. So I would sort of point to some of these, these networked technologies as uh, essential to building normative uh, support for an understanding of, uh, you know, how we can be more healthy societies. I'm just wondering if you have concrete examples of where health behaviors have changed as a result of a particular smartphone application. I can, I can give one example. Um, well, there, I think there are a lot of examples of that, but one specific one that I think gets to what I, I interpret you to be saying, in other words, not thinking of the mobile phone simply as a channel. Right, as was discussed earlier, but the idea that it's a behavior change device. So I think a good example of that, some of the work that the CDC has done in the United States encouraging um, uh, vaccinations and immunizations, uh, especially around events that have transpired. So for example, there was an outbreak of pertussis in California uh, in the summer of 2010, if I'm remembering correctly, and they used uh, a mobile phone-based campaign uh, to encourage um, folks to go visit their doctor. Uh, so that was a, you know, the use of the mobile phone in response to a healthcare event uh, to mobilize public action. But that's still a communication, I mean, that's... Yeah, well, it was a behavior change uh, uh, outcome. So it, I guess the question is, what do you mean then by behavior well, change, I'm if not that? Off the comment earlier, because, right. right, isn't that, that's a high-tech bus poster. Yeah. Right, it's coming directly to me, perhaps, but it's still, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my brain around what you were talking about earlier in terms of. Mm. Can I give it a try? Sure. Um, I'll go back to cell phones and text messaging in Bangladesh. Giving phones, well, they didn't have to give them to them, they had them. Giving them to moms and to midwives. This is a country where, what, 60%, 70% of women deliver in the home? Um, and where maternal mortality is high, relatively speaking, to this country and looking at the direct public impact of being able to signal when or if an obstetric emergency is happening and have that woman either be taken rapidly to care or care come to her. And that's, we've measured it, we've so shown it, there's a 40% reduction in maternal mortality over the last 10 years in Bangladesh. So, so that goes beyond the frequent uses of M health as a reminder. Because when you have a strong positive social norm, then if you remind people about certain things, getting tested or checked with 
doctors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or you know, practice certain behaviors, it's likely that it is a high-tech way of reminding people about what what's going on. But your example is about actually when there is a problem, when there is a weak social norm or a weak practice, and how you can sort of uh, nudge people to actually seek out advice or seek out help. And it changes the norm about women don't have to die. Right. You can look for help. Right. Anyone? Yeah. Hi there, Brian and Brendan from the Pan American Health Organization. One, I'd just like to make one comment on the um, M Health that uh, Frank just mentioned, and that is it becomes a conversation. Um, so that in vaccines, it's not just a doctor saying to people, go get vaccinated, but kids will actually encourage their friends, and what are you doing? And it becomes, are you going to be there? And we're going to. Um, but I wanted to ask about the longer term commitment to um, communication programs, say with USAID, because as the as administrations change, we saw last time with CDC, there was a marketing center, then there's not a marketing center. And, and really, the, the issue of communication, your book looks excellent because it covers so many facets of communication, which I think is so important. And that, um, Without that commitment, and how do you get it or push for that? Because obviously it's not just USA ideas, but that longer term commitment to health and not just it being reinventing the wheel of whether or not it's the public information part right. or the theory part. That was sort of, that's a great question. I was going to add it sort of what is the perception? about the role of communication, the contributions of communication. Julie mentioned something earlier about the, how we manage expectations. And that has to do with sort of the continuity, continued support for communication programs and our partners understanding what communication is. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of expectations that our colleagues, partners, people who manage health programs have about what communication actually can Deliver. Just say one quick thing, which is back to the, the point about communication as part of integrated programs. I mean, it is not the complete solution. There have been a fair number of evidence reviews on the effectiveness of health communication programs, and typically we get 5 to 10 percent effect sizes in terms of uh, the attributable portion of changes in behavior that can be attributed, that is, to, to health communication campaigns. So clearly, there are other components to the solution. If we want to get big effects, on uh, pervasive public health programs, we have to integrate communication into other programs, and I think that needs to be recognized. That's part of the solution. Elizabeth? I'm not quite sure where this fits in, but it's trying to say, you know, how we're looking at where communication is now in terms of health programs at USAID and, and you know, broader sort of interagency with partners. Um, we're I, don't, I wouldn't say struggling, but we're really running to keep up uh, with the changes in technology and the changes in partners and the different kinds of ways to do things that we never even thought we could do five years ago or three years ago in terms of um, using the cloud, do, using different kinds of, of access to information. For example, last Monday, our administrator launched something called Every Child Deserves a Fifth Birthday. I don't know if any of you caught that. It wasn't a big news event. Uh, but it involves getting everybody in the world to put a picture of themselves up when they were five um, on the web. Um, and what it is is trying to really kind of reframe the next post-MDG child survival challenge, no? And it's just gone like this, the number of pictures of people five years old up on the web. Um, in, you know, I think we're up to 100 million now. And that part of that's domestic, part of it's international, but it's trying to say, how do you change the norm about child survival? How do you keep child survival in people's attention, both as moms, as ministers, as funders? And we, don't, we didn't kind of measure things before we did that. We didn't do a public opinion poll about how people feel about kids under five dying. Um, but it's trying to say, how do you capture this really quick social media in terms of building a new norm about child survival. And though, so I say we're rushing to keep up in terms of using those communication 
developments in public health in a different way. Here on the panel, any questions, comments? Yes. Hi, Joanna Harvey from the Faith of Vaccine Institute. I have actually a question building off of what you said. How do you translate that kind of broad public awareness campaign back into country-owned policy and the policies that come from donor government? Like, it's great that we had 100,000 people tweet, but what does that really mean? 100 million. 100 million. What does that really mean, like, at the end of the day in terms of policy and influence? Or are you guys tracking that? much broader effort that will involve um, a, a large-scale call to action that's going to be sponsored by countries and by our own government. Uh, the ministry, the uh, government of India and the government of Ethiopia um, are getting, and it's, there's a multi-sectoral effort around this. This campaign, every, ca every child des deserves a fifth birthday, is just part of it. But it obviously involves building the policy awareness, building the support, looking at, um, looking really hard at data, looking at what we know about uh, bending the curve in reducing under five mortality so that within a generation, um, every country will have a level of child mortality similar to that in the OECD countries. What that will take, and what it'll take in terms of vaccines, what it'll take in terms of ORS, what it'll take in terms of PMTCT, um, just really looking at the numbers. but doing hard numbers, but then doing crazy communication things at the same time, um, so that you can fit it all together with hard policy decisions and data-driven um, analysis. Julie? Thinking about something that I often call policy with a capital P versus policy with a small p. So, it's really, I think, really hard to make that link at a, at a international or national policy level, but I th think many of these activities could really link well with communities, um, and you can have lots of what could either be semi-formal policies in a community or in a given healthcare setting or in a given school or et cetera that, that, see, that can still influence a lot of people, um, and we're, I think, still struggling to have a framework of how they all link together given all of the different activities, exciting activities going on, and some to, to a certain extent noise, but I think that, and it's even hard to track what any given institution or project is doing. There's just so many activities, but on the, so that's hard. On the same, at the same time, I think that this all contributes to a bigger picture where you're ending up changing norms and you're changing, I mean, it's all shifts that are shifting either nationally or globally, but I think that, getting back to my original point about the small p, I think you can, influence a lot of local policies without having to do the big picture. We are now changing it on a national level or international level. But I think that uh, also that the question is, we seem to know or trying to, you know, we're getting better at knowing how to create awareness or reframing certain global health issues through using mHealth and new technologies. But I think the question is, how do we know that effectively changes very specific issues from health systems to social norms to uh, attitudes. And going back to the question about how do we document that? How do we know how to take this step forward? If it's just awareness raising, how do we go beyond that? And I think that's sort of part of the challenge that we are confronted. We are getting better at knowing how it works in terms of awareness raising. Beyond that, it seems to me that that's sort of part of the agenda that still you know, we need to pursue further. asking about has a lot to do with that idea of slacktivism and how like everyone will tweet anything and like all the pages but does it change anything but what I've seen from the other side in kind of like the academic world is a lot of people in my sort of sphere are very almost not threatened by it but very dismissive of it and they kind of make fun of their friends who do it and they they think it's a bit ridiculous because they're not devoting their entire lives to social justice the way people who might think they are in other fields. So I think that your question, and it's not just um, documenting it, but how do we harness mm -hmm. that sense of, that new sense of connection that I think is new, that you actually could be Facebook friends with that person you met on that volunteerism trip, you know? And, and can we do good things with that, or is it really just a, a joke? And you know, I think that there's so much time and energy and money going into these, these forms of connection that Right now, it's hard to see what it's actually leading to, but I think our, our job is to kind of try to 
harness that in a way that putting that picture of yourself at five years old does lead you to like, you know, send a letter to your MP or your, you know. No. Uh, I, I think um, all of these things that we're talking about uh, can be measured. Um, they come, the, 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 the information about these phenomena, whether it's attitudes or social nor shifts in social norms or a, a feeling of interconnection with other people, uh, you know, all of these things can be measured. The question is then how we, there, there are two questions. One is sort of how we capture those, how we measure those, and the extent to which we build those, that, that measurement process into our projects, right? I, there's, um, Sometimes you feel like there are, are a lot of resources available to a project, but there are a lot of competing pressures on the use of those resources. And we, we may be at a point where we really need to invest a little bit more in the measurement side of these things. But then that creates the need for us to analyze those in a proper way. And this is what I was alluding to at the very beginning. Um, you know, the understanding the process of communication requires data at multiple levels. It requires structural level data. My friend Carol Underwood is always reminding us that um, the, the structures that surround people influence the choices that they make. And, and so if someone doesn't make a healthy choice, it's not always their fault. It's because they don't have uh, opportunities. So we need to be able to both measure and analyze these relationships across levels and over time. Because as one thing changes, it leads to A and B, and A and B lead to C, D, and E, and C, D, and E lead to other things. So we, we really need to build into our programs the ability to measure the right things and then analyze them in the proper way so that we can demonstrate the relationships that are, that are, that are probably at the heart of, of a long-term communication process. Julie? I agree, <laughs> and my caveat would be, when I see often, not often, I, I think there's an education process and an advocacy process about what evidence is effective, what, what evidence is convincing and what evidence is not convincing. So getting back to Silvio's question about sort of why is it that we're presenting evidence and that we have, we're keeping presenting evidence, I had the opportunity to do a longitudinal study, 3,000 people, multiple cities in Nicaragua, looking at an edu edu edutainment program and um, called Punto, uh, led by Puntos de Encuentro. Very effective in lots of different ways across, based on the conceptual framework. There was changing of norms, attitudes, we, multi-level, et cetera. And then some people in the audience are, were skeptical. Is that all you get from a communication program? And so I think, like, back to managing expectations, it's got to be combined with the types of activities. And what you got were changes in people's view across a country over time. That would, it's a big deal, I think. But many people were like, well, what's the, you know, did they, did they, are they using condoms more? Though? You know, and some people were, but some people weren't. But that's back to the question that, you know, I. Uh, if you go back to previous waves of new communication technologies, the 60s and 70s and the 80s, there was always the notion that the new technology will be effectively used and transform all kinds of things, particularly health outcomes. So people who are not communication experts have one of these devices and say, like, everybody's using it. You should be able to do something effectively to address some of these challenges. And then the communication sort of EORs come back, well, it's more, more complex than that. It's not so, so easy. How do we address those sort of that excitement and the pro probably sort of disproportionate expectations about what M Health or for that matter, you know, all the old communication technologies can actually do? Yeah, I, I think it's an issue here of part of it of the issue for me here is how is change possible? What makes people change? Um, I think this the example you come of the five year old mm -hmm. is exciting because it makes people feel. And, yeah. And and so we get beyond just the consequence model of change that yes, we're rational beings and we're gonna do that, to I'm feeling something here and I'm and I and I create an identity that may not have existed before with another person who I may not know. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that opens up people to change. Obviously, that has to follow by direction. What path, then, do you take with that new feeling, that new experience that you have? Uh, but I think when we get down to it, this is, we have to get down to that, those fundamentals of, of how people change and what makes them change and what motivates them to change. And I think being, feeling people is one of the most important aspects of that. Can I just say, in, in describing a sequential consequence model, as you described, I wasn't uh, for a moment discounting the possibility that emotional reaction, what you feel in response to a situation or an encounter with another person, is not a part of that, of that process. It's absolutely an essential one. And we, we traditionally have not done a very good job of incorporating emotion into our explanatory models of change. Sure. I point out that, uh, again, back to the most successful communicators who were out there, big commercial brands, what do they do to brand their products? They create emotional connections with their consumers. That's what they do. So I think we, we haven't been particularly good at that, although there is certainly, to be fair, quite a bit of research on uh, the influence of emotion, for example, the Fear Appeals Research and, and others. And one of my colleagues here, Mitchell, Mitchell Turner, focuses specifically on that, that topic. Um, but we haven't done a very good job of figuring out how to incorporate emotion into behavior change programs, uh, behavior change communications as components of larger uh, programs that use multiple components, including policy, community, and so forth. Maybe that's one of the answers to the first question that we address. Some sort of the most interesting, exciting lines of inquiry is how we either bring back or sort of uh, put at the forefront questions about emotion related to change around health uh, outcome. Other questions? Yes. My name is Marcia Mikowski, and I'm in health communications. And the, there, there was a thing uh, just I read on the internet. Leona McCormick wrote a pretty well-reasoned uh, bit on the Coney, Stop Coney. And, this, and emotion was the first thing. And also a sense of urgency. And it seems like, you know, like in the riots back in Detroit in the early 60s, Everybody was on the phone, and everybody in the community was at the place where those riots were happening just within minutes because it mattered to them. So like the emotion aspect of it, of course, that's going to resonate with people. And it seems that you know the whole Miguel Cedito approach with the uh, entry education dramas and all of that, that's really based on a lot of emotion. And right. so many of the different organizations are doing that, focusing on that. And it seems like. And, and she, another thing she said in that article was just that trying to get people to make behavior change on a long-term process, you know, not something that they feel is urgent today, that's going to show up less dramatically than if it's something that everyone can get behind right now. So maybe it's about positioning these issues in an urgent way. Right. Great point. For today. Julia? Uh, thanks. Julia Rosenbaum with um, FHI 360, the Wash Plus Project, USA Wash Plus Project. Um, in talking about emotions, I might want to add that to that list of sort of trends that we started with is, I don't know if it's the return to or maybe a more concerted harnessing of those emotional approaches. And I know when HIV first hit and we started uh, making responses, there were a lot of those emotional responses, particularly fear, and for all kinds of reasons, you know, they, they were found not to be effective if it was the Grim Reaper side, and people like Kim Whitty have done really important work trying to look at fear and self-efficacy together as a, um, a quite effective approach. And what's interesting, when I move from some health issues to working in water and sanitation, I think that's one area where there sort of a more advanced use of some of those emotive responses, and particularly community-led total sanitation that, that very explicitly uses fear and disgust that you are eating your own feces and therefore the whole community commits and then takes action and hand washing some of the London school work has gone back to disgust as the most sort of primary motivator for, for hand washing. And perhaps the research is there, I asked the panel, but otherwise maybe one area we need to try and do is look, you know, what does it mean to harness those emotions, and particularly as they relate to social norms? Because I think that is a lot of what's happening, is when you can hit that really resonant emotion, 
it's, it's some way an express route to getting at a change in social norms, because therefore you have at least something of a coordinated or a, a mass emotive response that propels forward and, and I think chisels into that normative level. Martin? Uh, building on those things, I <coughs> was very impressed to see how these new partners and new technologies uh, have managed to uh, handle emotions in the case of pandemics, recent pandemic situations where uh, you could see the mapping and tracking of the epidemic, which immediately trigger a response at all societal levels. From the international, here at IMF and the World Bank, discussing immediate activities that needed to be done by ministers of finance, not ministers of health, to confront an epidemic that was three days from landing in their country, all the way down to community responses. I, I don't know, I mean, we're talking about new partners. Google probably knows very well how to measure things. <laughs> and when we are starting to uh, approach and align with these organizations, would there be new possibilities of managing emotions like fear or uh, measuring results uh, on things that we can see are uh, shifting completely the way to which we look at prevention, immediate response, intersectoral uh, alignments and collaboration. Anyone in the panel? I, know, I would just say I, I think uh, this, the um, phenomenon of, of something going viral uh, these days is really it's completely driven by emotion. People are, are expressing something that they're feeling with regard to an issue, and that's where you see these sort of these these uh, you know the emergence of uh, tweets and Facebook uh, connections and, and cell phone connections and so on. So I, I do think we need to look a lot more closely at how emotion plays a role in this sort of immediate response, and 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 then of course as, as more and more people, as I was saying earlier, as more and more people communicate about something that they're feeling passionately about, it shifts the perception of what's common, what's normative. So these things are, are, are completely intertwined. I guess what I would say is, I mean, on one level it's sort of an obvious comment, but on another level it's not obvious what to do about it. it the idea of, you know, what, what commercial marketers do is they, they use emotion to f frame an issue, right, to frame a choice. Uh, and, and if you, you know, if, if uh, if, if you feel guilty about something and you're presented with a situation where you can alleviate that guilt by doing something, right, the environment is framed for you in a way that, that presents that choice to you, then you will more than likely take that option of trying to alleviate your guilt by doing the behavior. And so those kinds of things happen naturally, right? They happen virally and then people respond to them. What we're not particularly good at doing in health and health communication is creating those frames, right? Commercial marketers are, are fantastic at creating those frames in order to get us to, to make choices based on emotion. We're so-so at it. So I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on becoming better at. But I think that also, at least in our field, it historically has raised all kinds of ethical questions mm -hmm. about that not, all the, that not all emotions are fair game, but some emotions may be complicated ethically to uh, address even for good causes you know, fear. Yes, we know that we can increase risk perception, or we can increase the perception of tangible benefits for doing something else, but that's not necessarily the same. And I'm not just talking about fear. Even if you sort of appeal to emotion or connectivity to the stuff that commercial advertising has done so, you know, well uh, for, for decades, I'm not clear that in the field people feel that it's sort of, you know, it's legitimate to appeal to, let's say, good emotions, connectivity, family, all that, even though we have done it. Because somehow you are, quote unquote, manipulating people into doing something. So uh, I think that's a value analogy. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying that's my read of what has happened in the field. Craig? If, if it's genuine, it's not manipulation. I, it, the other thing is fear, I'm not an advocate of fear. <laughs> fear narrows one's perception of reality and often leads to projection onto others of, of the, the fear of you have your your flight response, you know. It, it, so I, I think that's, that, and I've seen in places, again, I'll go back to an example of Mozambique, uh, there's been some interesting studies on 
uh, the fear about HIV AIDS in the early campaigns and how that was projected out and really increased stigma against people living with uh, HIV AIDS. Um, and, but emotion in the sense of creating identity with others, uh, a sense of who I am as a person, uh, um, or my community. I've seen this too in communities where communities have developed this sense of this is who we are. We don't tolerate this. Uh, uh, not using the latrine uh, is not a good member of the community. That's not who we are. We care for each other. I mean, I've, I've seen this at the local level, pick, picked up by churches and mosques uh, often. Um, very powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff. Really moves campaigns forward. Do we have time for two or three more comments or questions? Yes. One thing further on that. Um, she was mentioning about using emotion and then how, especially in the Coney one, how that could cross the line, you know, using fear and um, even making it almost pornographic by using, really getting visceral emotions involved in various things. Say, in the Coney effort, there's all these horrible images and things, right? But to try to get people to act. And the other thing I was thinking is, how do you go from the tweet and the viral and all these people talking about it, where does the communication, uh, the, the whole model, have the action element? How does it easily transfer from, now we've got a whole bunch of new friends interested in this, how are we now going to do some action? Like in the Obama campaign, there was all these neighborhood groups and, uh, you know, just, they just went really down to the grassroots level creating avenues to right. organize action, and that might be a good way to get some... And I will add to that sort of very doable actions, very concrete actions that people can do easily mm -hmm. once you get them enthusiastic about an idea or you get them pay attention. Uh, in political communication, we have some evidence about how that has been done in some campaigns. In health, I think that we still need to do a bit more, especially when, when we integrate sort of social media around sort of very specific uh, uh, actions, right? What would be the equivalent of donate now or contact or call somebody or go to a certain square? I mean, what would be the equivalent in health communications in terms of that sort of a very fertile uh, area of, uh, of research and, and, and practice? Uh, we'd like to give you a chance if you want to make sort of any closing comments or final words. I think it depends on the behavior. And that's what we also have to keep in mind, I think, with all these things, is not all health behaviors are alike. Some are one-shot deals, some are over your whole life, some are community, some you can do by your own self. I mean, it's really breaking down, like, as we get smarter about communication, also getting smarter about the behavior itself. And that is a field I think we've tended to kind of lump things, and being able to make more specific both recommendations and then also the need for data around the types of behaviors. Okay, um, I think the last thing I would want to say here is the importance for people implementing these programs to maintain humility. Um, I've, I've seen so much outsiders coming in with cultural baggage and not understanding the dynamics of local not being sensitive to it. Um, and um, especially um, who are the power brokers in the community? Who are, we're, we're talking about the gender thing. I just, I, I realize when I go into a lot of rural communities and we're in community meetings, we begin to ask, all right, who's the midwife? Who's the, um, uh, who's the traditional healer? Uh, these are just really important power brokers in society. Once you break the ice like that, the community opens up and begins talking to that. And you find that the women who are often the traditional healers are often the midwives, just powerful members of the community that don't fit into um, formal kinds of structures, but uh, are really important. And um, so, to, you know, just the humility of, of being open to uh, what, what's on the ground and who these people are and what's valuable to them. Let's see, a final comment, I guess. <clears throat> I would say something about, as I was sort of listening to the discussion around emotion, et cetera, I think it's very important um, in, de 
individual perspective, as a more the cognitive individual, emotional perspective. And I would, my plea would be to take us back to the more the ecological model to make sure we're taking into account some of the other issues that have been mentioned. So we can have individual choice. There are circumstances where the community is making the decision about something. There are circumstances like gender dynamics where within a couple, one member of the couple wouldn't necessarily have the ability to make a decision. We are talking about uh, structural and policy environments where there's stigma and discrimination or other issues that you need to take into account. They all play out on <coughs> what an individual eventually is able to enact or not. And while this is a model, it does, as opposed to a theory telling us how to address it, it does help us see that it's really important to have interventions <coughs> or activities related to all those different levels and not just the message that comes out. Um, and so some of the work that we've done over time and others have shown that it's really when you add these levels together that you get additional impact. So let's, that would be my plea. Yeah, I also want to um, thank you for including me on this panel. It's quite a privilege to be up here with you. Um, and I guess in terms of closing comments, just to what I'm thinking about is continuing to consider how that message can come up and how the powers that be can be receptive to those messages. Because ultimately, these are channels for the, the current dynamics that are already in place. And you have to think of ways that those voices can be heard and that what they're saying actually gets acted upon. So from a perspective in Indian public health, is how, how do we get the, the denial of healthcare rights, that, raise, that increased awareness of their rights, to actually have a channel to improve the system to actually deliver those rights? an equivalent of donate now in health communication but I think we uh, this isn't quite that but I think we should remember the power of diffusion uh, we've talked a lot about communication in different ways but we haven't talked much we've touched on it maybe uh, about the idea of communication in order to influence people to influence others and uh, for example children influencing their parents now that's not quite donate now but uh, a message that that get somebody to influence another that they have some potential to, to help, to aid, to improve their health, I think is a very powerful thing. And we have to remember to uh, use that, that powerful tool in our programs. And I guess I would sort of come at this from the, the uh, try to come at it from the perspective of the field. Um, we're, we're, it's likely that we will always be challenged uh, from the from those on the sort of the biomedical side who say, well, what does communication have to do with HIV infection? Right? Um, and the and it's really the wrong question um, because you know communication doesn't affect the HIV virus, but it affects behaviors that influence the transmission. And similarly, we're, we're likely to be challenged from the macro side who say, uh, you know, what does communication have to do with with uh, with inequities, global inequities? Um, but I think this book is, a, is a, an extremely valuable uh, compendium of what we know and believe about the impact of, of communication on many different levels. I think we should all sort of go out of this room feeling like advocates for communication. We sometimes undermine our own case. You know, someone says, well, you know, communication doesn't work. You say, well, yeah, we don't really have the evidence for this, or we don't have the evidence for that. And, and so it gives the impression that we ourselves doubt that communication can make a difference. Right? We, we believe that communication changes the world. Most of us do, I think, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and I think we should be advocates for that position. And this book gives us a lot of the, the evidence and the ammunition to make that case effectively and say, well, perhaps we don't measure this properly, but right, this, we, we believe that if, if conceptualized properly and measured properly, um, we can demonstrate the, what we believe is right, true right. about communication. So let's go out. And for my conclusions, I kindly invite you to read the conclusions of this. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. I want to also thank uh, the Director of Communication at the School of Media and Public Affairs, Samara Sid, who put together this uh, great event. Took a lot of work and it came out wonderful. So thank you very much and uh, see you next time.